Okay, so uh, Philip Hillman, I'm the chairman of the JLL Alternatives team in the UK. I'm also responsible for uh, coordinating our work across Europe, Middle East and Africa in the student housing sector, working closely with Stuart Osborne. Stuart, put your hand up. Thank you. Great, Derek. Right, Derek, Derek Williams, I head up investment management for EMEA at GSA, uh, Global Student Accommodation. Uh, we have presence in eight countries, 30 cities globally, although I'm focused and my team's focused on EMEA. Uh, we have exposure in Dublin, Germany, uh, UK, and uh, to be confirmed, new markets. Okay, great, Keith. Hi everybody, Keith White, Managing Director of CRM Students, currently uh, a UK-based operating platform. We manage the risk for the investors, that's what we do. Uh, currently look after and provide services to some 24,000 beds in the UK and being increasingly asked to advise on and give support to the new investors into the European space plus also our existing clients who are seeing, as Philip demonstrated, a slightly maturing but not mature market in the UK and are looking to transfer their good experience in the UK into the European space. Great. Rainer. Hi, I'm Rainer Nonngesser. I'm heading the student housing platform within MPC Capital. We're focused on the German market. We develop and operate student accommodation under the brand name Stay2. And uh, our universe currently is roughly 1,000 beds. Great. Lizette? My name is Lisette van Doorn. I head up Urban Land Institute in Europe. We are a global nonprofit, real estate nonprofit organization. 40,000 members globally, 3,000 in Europe, and we focus on research, as you've seen, networking, education, and uh, uh, community advisory. Great, Paul. Um, Paul Bashir, CEO of Roundhill Capital. Roundhill are an accommodation um, themed investment manager operating across Europe. Um, I also head up the student accommodation platform, and probably best known for owning uh, the Nido Collection. Um, currently operational in five countries across Europe, uh, and our aim is to have 20,000 beds by 2020. I'll copy you all 2020. Great, Charlie. <laughs> uh, Charlie McGregor, the founder and CEO of the Student Hotel. Uh, we're busy expanding our current portfolio of nine hotels uh, open and nine under construction to about 40 by 2020, although also aiming for about 17,000 <laughs> beds. We do student housing uh, uh, with a twist. We also have within our uh, properties uh, rooms dedicated for young professionals as well as uh, regular hotel guests. And we've just opened our own co-working facility uh, within our buildings as well. Okay, good. Um, I wanted to pick up one of the central kind of themes that uh, Walter mentioned, which was about political risk, how that impacts, and that's been a theme actually for the last kind of 12 months in sessions that we've been doing more generally. Um, when you're looking at it um, as an investor, um, how do you see that? Do you, is it just a risk that you have to accept that the market will move on, that the, the actual fundamentals of the student housing market mean that it's going to be attractive no matter what? How, how do you see some of the the risks that we've been talking about? Fundamentally, we feel you know, the student sector has been proven that it's a very defensive asset class. Uh, you know, positive rental growth through a number of cycles over the last 25 years. Obviously, we're in another cycle uh, right now. Uh, GSA, we actually did a transaction post-Brexit uh, as UK transaction, the largest in the sector in the UK last year, uh, with the backing of GIC of Singapore. That transaction started before Brexit, uh, the Brexit vote. Um, so I would say, you know, long-term thinking um, to really have a sense of quantitatively how much exposure your portfolio has to the EU. Um, that's obviously the, the highest risk part of the uh, part of the market. Um, so EU students represent around five percent of the total full-time students in the UK. But clearly, focusing on the UK for, uh, for a second. Um, you know, the strong universities, the lure of the UK and the English language system we feel are all pervasive, but um, we do feel there are potentially some weaker universities, weak, weaker markets, so recycling capital um, is, a, is a prudent approach in our view. And, and Charlie, you're obviously at the moment looking to expand your operations uh, beyond Holland and into other countries. Um, What's driving in that, and in terms of your investment, do you see those kinds of political risks 
as an issue for you? Um, does, it, does it change your strategy? Uh, yeah, it does, I guess, change our strategy a little bit. We pulled out of a project. Can, can you hear me? We, uh, we pulled out of a project in, in Glasgow, for example, uh, because we felt that the, the dynamics of that particular city within Scotland and the UK were not... Uh, not so sensible to, to proceed with, but on the other side, we are on a mission to really become... Uh, it's kind of a bit echoey, try that one. Try and become uh, the, the main European, the mainland player in, in Europe, so building up a real network of uh, hotels for our uh, students and young professional network. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to shuffle this now because it's very, it's very good for my own personal fitness. Um, so, Philip, you mentioned also that there are... <sighs> that the UK, Europe are kicking themselves in the foot, in a sense, at the moment. Um, do, you, do you think that's going to impact on student movement or not? Uh, yeah, I, th I think it will affect movement. Uh, I think if you assume that Brexit is now going to have no impact on international and European student numbers here in cloud cuckoo land, it's going to have an impact. The UK will lose market share, but it's a market that's getting bigger. So what the net impact will be is hard to determine. And then it also, I think, we're perhaps helped by some of Trump's rhetoric, which with the USA being by far the biggest market for international students, if there's any decision not to go to the US, then maybe the UK might benefit from some of that. But I think, yes, there's going to be an impact um, it's too early, though, to predict what the actual impact on numbers will be. But most operators who have international students are looking very carefully at the university applications data. And believe me, universities are looking even more carefully. Uh, and the universities are nervous. Um, and Reiner, on the opposite side of that, obviously you're active in, in Germany. Um, does that then mean that you're seeing more of an opportunity with Germany as a relatively stable market, um, that you're expecting both growth from, um, let's say, growth from pent-up demand there perhaps, but also growth from international students looking at international courses in, in Germany from, from the rest of Europe and elsewhere? I could easily imagine a case uh, that shows Germany in that context as... Uh a winner in a way that a the US and the UK immigration policy the uncertainties has a strong traffic impact into uh, continental Europe within continental Europe the ETP uh, statistics have shown that the language barrier is uh, ceasing to exist over time um, for taking studies in Germany and we are not the, the weakest part in the Eurozone commercially. And last but not least, I think we provide still um, an opportunity for young people from around the world or from the Eurozone um, due to the demographic effects we face in Germany. And therefore, I think, bottom line, there are very good prospects for the next years for the German student accommodation market. Okay, good. Um, one of the things I also wanted to pick up with you, Keith, is um, obviously in a slightly different position, very successful in the UK market. Um, are you now actively looking far more at continental Europe and, and, and what does that mean? We're a UK-based operating platform, as anybody who knows us are. And as I say, we, we just provide services some 24,000 beds and have a pipeline going out for the next three years, which will another have another eight to ten thousand of that but that's by the by we're increasingly looking at europe because we see the opportunity there our clients and investors we're speaking to are saying to us we need a robust platform to help us get going to understand the granularity of the businesses that we're in and if anybody doesn't understand the appreciate the granularity of managing letting and operating a student business then they really need to step back to some basic principles um, but you know we're close to operating in a number of countries in the UK, uh, in Europe, um, including Italy, Spain, Portugal, um, and uh, I have some meetings later this week on Switzerland of all places, which is a name that hasn't really come up, but we have uh, some strong interest there. And 
people invite or people have conversations with two types of people I always think in this space when they're looking at it they'll talk to, to JLL on their research and their other in, in detailed experience in the space but they also talk to people like us because as I say we have that granular experience and if they work with us we're expecting to deliver their returns and if we don't then we have some challenges but it's an interesting time okay great Derek did you want to pick that up so I think uh, you know basic headline demand supply analysis is is important so we saw some up on the screen earlier uh, Dublin is a market that that we're in with, with our partner there in the front row Daniel uh, Harrison Street uh, that market for example when we entered the market a couple of years ago had demand supply and balance of a nine to one ratio so nine excess demand to one available bed based on our analysis uh, now it's around a seven to one ratio uh, so we have 2,500 beds in the pipeline that took a lot of know-how site finding planning applications appeals uh, getting people on the ground to develop that um, to develop that as a platform and then there's the operational aspect you know speaking to that the branding the booking system um, the look and feel uh, that we can take uh, and others can take hopefully from their wider portfolio and bring that to bear in a market like Dublin and Germany is a similar situation very much a studio led market demand supply and balance I think for professionally run student accommodation operator and capital to go into those markets is compelling Paul in, in terms of Round Hill, obviously, um, very active, um, increasingly active in continental Europe. Um, what are your views at the moment on the market? We've, we've seen that there's a lot of investor appetite. What are you seeing in terms of growth, and what are your expectations in terms of your investment strategy? Um, well, it's been a really interesting market in the last year, and then the one thing I do know is uh, not to predict anything for the next 12 months in advance. Um, I think the one thing we have to remember, how come this is really loud for me, and it wasn't for everyone else, but um, is student housing is an operational investment class we've just talked about, so it's inherently um, influenced by a lot of market-based factors, both micro and macro. Um, and therefore, you need to take a long-term view of fundamentals. I think Philip touched on most of the fundamentals that we still believe in in the market. You know, strong supply, demand imbalances, a significant yield arbitrage between residential and student, um, and, and really how that differs across Europe. I think it's still a very interesting marketplace looking at some of the dynamics on a country-by-country -country basis and understanding why they exist and where that um, is an opportunity or, a, or a, a risk or a threat. So we are still very bullish on the um, student housing market space. I think the, the, the type of investment strategy differs by geographical location. Um, quite often you can't buy or it's becoming more competitive to buy and therefore building and or repositioning is really the only strategy. Um, but I think, you know, it's one of the first, um, I think, points of research that's where I've seen the the, the, the arbitrage between residential and student really highlighted as one of the driving factors. And that's why we got into student accommodation in 2011 in the UK, because we felt when the rest of the market was looking at students priced at six and a quarter in central London, we looked at resi priced at three and a quarter. Yes, there's a planning district difference. Yes, there's a operational um, um, uh, you know, difference in terms of cost base but we felt that 300 basis points spread was too far. Um, whether that's a benefit of hindsight or other macro events that have worked in our favor, it's turned out to be the case. So we are focused now on finding the next locations in Europe where, um, and I think Philip's has given our investment strategy away on the, uh, on the slide there. But um, sorry for the long answer, but it was, uh, it's a big question and I think we are very bullish on, uh, on the student market. Okay, good. I just want to add a piece on the UK. I mean, having warned about an impact on international student numbers, it might, like, it might sound as though I'm saying the UK is done. It's mature. It's, there's no more opportunities. Well, that's, that's rubbish. There are lots of opportunities to build a certain type of product in the right place in the UK. And you can do so with the benefit of transparency of transactions and with a stable market, uh, stable rental growth track record, and with some of the best universities in the world attracting international students. 
So I'm just, I just don't want people to assume that because we've always had lots of international students, we will be unaffected. We will be, un we will be affected. But it's had a hell of a head start, the UK, on the rest of Europe. And I don't think it's going to lose all those advantages straight away. But the opportunities in Europe are very significant. But I do think that the yield, the risk-reward curve is, is not stabilized and mature yet in Europe. The market's still working out where yields should be, and it hasn't quite worked it out yet in some of those countries. Um, I wanted to pick up with you. I mean, the, I mean actually, I'll, I'll, if, if we see, do we, do we then think that there's going to be much more of the kind of universities then setting up their brand um, elsewhere in Europe? So, for example, I think Cambridge is planning to do something in France. Um, do you think that, that that's going to be more... Uh, that, that's going to be more on the cards now with, with Brexit. Do you think that's one solution that the UK universities will find? I think not necessarily in Europe. I think they'll be doing it across the world, and they are doing it. Um, and even actually some provincial universities in the UK are setting up London bases. And yes, they are focusing more on international student markets. So both for recruiting students inwardly, but also, as you say, partnering with existing institutions elsewhere in the world. I think we need to look beyond just a European horizon. I know that's our focus today, but there are lots of universities looking at opportunities in the Gulf, um, in China, uh, and elsewhere in other markets. So yes, it will happen, and I think we're gonna see higher education uh, being shaken up quite significantly with new players coming in who will offer students the choice of multi-locational degrees for a year or two. The likes of Holt have been doing that, where you can study in New York and then you study in London. Nice if you can afford it. Um, yeah. Good, thank you. Um, and, and Paul, you also mentioned um, about the sort of types of accommodation that there would be. And I know, Reiner, you've been developing micro-living as well as student housing. Um, but Charlie, just, just from you, you've obviously chosen to go down a specific route um, with the student hotel. Um, do you think that particular business is going to evolve beyond students and hotel visitors? Um, how do you see that? How do you see that working? I hope so. Um, yeah, I mean, we think, to be honest, that we're uh, pretty well placed. We have uh, we see it three dials on our business plan: students, young professionals, and, and hotel guests. Um, so, depending on the economic uh, climate at that time, we can turn one dial higher or, or, or lower. Um, but I think, you know, the, the core of our business is, is students um, and, and for all of us. And I think the, the rise of internationalization, of the, the, the wishes of young people to have an experience that is more than just an education experience is growing. Europe is, uh, mainland Europe is uh, massively undersupplied compared to the UK. Uh, has an advantage of English-speaking courses, but also other European languages, which are also very popular to, to be part of that education uh, experience. Um, so it's, it, it is a, I mean, nobody really knows, but I think there was an interesting uh, part of the presentation, which is about the, the money you have behind you. Um, and, you know, I think all of us are uh, been through enough to see that if you sell at the wrong moment and you're, 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 you're really playing a wrong card. So if, you're, if you've got a good operational business uh, and you know that your, uh, the stability of your income stream or the, the, the client base is, is there, then it just makes sense to, to wait it out if there is a, a dip or a, uh, in, in any, any market we're in. We just hold it out and, and, and wait till the right moment to, to find the next investor. Okay, good. And Reiner, obviously, you're, as I mentioned, you're mixing kind of micro-living with student housing. Is that kind of all part of the same story? Do you think this is creating a similar product uh, which is then suitable for a different number of potential occupiers? Um, yes and no. I think you need to make the differentiation between the more urban metropolitan spots where the borderline between students and young professional is a fluctuating one. And in the urban areas, you have a strong community of commuters. And um, especially in Germany, due to the federal system, you have a list of 50, 60 
towns who are primarily university cities where you still have an overweight on students as the tenants. But uh, when you look at the top 10, top seven cities in Germany, there is a strong urbanization trend and a strong requirement for design-oriented, fresh, young, affordable accommodation. And here, as said, the borderlines are more or less fluctuating between the target groups. Okay, and um, Keith, I wanted to pick up with you as well that idea of um, how the market here in continental Europe is developing. And obviously, from your point of view, in a way, that's like um, creating a, a known platform or a brand that enables it to be able to move forward like it has in the UK. What's your sense? You're obviously looking more at continental Europe. Um, how do you... How do you see that operating and what sort of growth are you expecting over the next sort of 12, 24 months? Um, I would say our expectation of growth in Europe uh, from the conversations we're having and what I'm hearing generally is it's going to be very significant. I don't think it was any surprise we saw student uh, accommodation as the most highly prized investment market going forward because it has certain characteristics that many others don't. You know how many 18-year-olds are coming. You know that they will go to university, or a percentage of them will. And therefore, you can project forward with quite a lot of certainty what's going to happen compared to a lot of other markets. So my expectation is that Europe over the next five years will be rapidly growing and will get very close to the European space very quickly, I believe. Uh, the UK space very quickly. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and also, um, for you, Derek, maybe in, in terms of the... Um, uh, it's been quite difficult for people in residential, um, the residential sector generally, to create a sort of pan-European portfolio. Do you think that's actually going to be more achievable, interestingly enough, in student housing before it is in residential? That's an interesting question. I, I can talk from the perspective of purpose-built student accommodation, because that's what we're doing. Um, I would say that the branding aspect within the student sector hasn't been fully tested and, and the upside from that hasn't been um, fully valued, so to speak, versus the hotel industry. Uh, so at GSA we're developing, we have a dual brand strategy that may well evolve going forwards into three to four brands. Um, so that gives us an entree into markets to operationally run portfolios without necessarily building the, the stock. Uh, and that's a very powerful way to get to know the markets. Um, obviously, there's a construction cycle to get into new markets, to find the right sites, to, to construct on the land, 18 months, two years, and then to develop that as a customer offering, i.e. the students, and develop relationships. So it does take a long gestation period, but I think being an operator is um, you know, kind of a, a stalking horse potentially into these new markets from our perspective, as well as bringing the capital in. Okay, good. Um, yep, Philip, go ahead. I just wonder whether five years, ten years from now, yes, we'll still recognise student housing as an asset class in its own right. We've been arguing that one for years. But that we'll also be talking more about the wider residential markets and thinking not just of PRS, private rental sector, but of senior living, uh, assisted living and so on. And actually looking at all these residential sectors as part of an operational residential asset class. I think they call it multifamily in the States. And frankly, that's what I think we'll be calling it here. And you think that's what's going to happen? I mean, it'd be interesting just to pick up on that with you, Paul, obviously, um, in, in terms of Round Hill. Do you see that as well? Do you see that this sort of more multifamily US approach is ultimately going to be coming to a store near us soon? <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, um, at the outset, I said that's how we got into student accommodation in the UK. Um, I think what people don't realize, we, we manage currently around 70,000 multifamily homes across Europe. It'll be over 100 by the end of this year. Um, so we are a big believer in brand. I think that's going to be one of the, the key trends you're going to see emerge over the course of the next three to five years. Um, I think also we are a great believer in co-living and how co-living trends are impacting not just student accommodation, but also short-term rental accommodation. 
and how you know like we've seen very well in in asia micro living with good cool communal spaces like in charlie's hotel i think you'll see that emerge um a lot across uh, a, a, lot, a lot of key european cities so i think when we talk about student accommodation um, we're actually talking about flexible living spaces which may incorporate students and non-students and I think, you know, naturally across certain locations um, where there is no planning difference between students and non-students, that's already happening. I think we've got examples in Germany, examples in Netherlands now uh, with Charlie and what Greystar are doing there, which is great. So I think you are already starting to see that and it's, uh, the, 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 the natural barrier to entry is just the planning. Um, and it's uh, sometimes, you know, the, the, the assets... Um, um, volume that you just can't get in London, for example, to create nice, flexible accommodation spaces at affordable rental levels, but you can elsewhere. Let's, let's, um, let's drill down a little bit, I think, into what the occupiers want, what the students want. Um, Keith, are there particularly trends that, um, that you're seeing at the moment, um, whether that's from what you've been doing in the UK, what the demand is from students, whether they need that sort of but you know whether, whether they're looking for smaller apartments but bigger shared space or you know how important broadband is whatever it might be the uh, you know what are the key things that that you've seen and how do you how do you expect to see that changing i think we ought to put the broadband thing to bed immediately it's just a given if you haven't got it forget it they won't turn up but then what's the first thing you guys ask when you move into a hotel can i have the wi-fi code you we just assume it's there so um, it's all about social space, social interaction, and giving people that freedom to mix with their peer group in the way they want to. I think the danger people fall into within the space is they give it a name and assume that's what the students will do with it. They will not. They will treat the space in a way that suits their needs. So you may put a cinema room up, but they'll use it for a whole range of things from sleepover evenings with, you know, to all kinds of different things that we would never ever get to because we're the wrong age. We just don't get it. Give them some space, give them some flexibility and they will populate it in the way that suits them. If you try and be prescriptive, you will die very rapidly. That's a very positive thought. <laughs> um, well, it sounds much more fun when I was at university, I have to say. It is. <laughs> um, Derek, in terms of, you're obviously operating globally, are there particular trends that you can pick up that you can see are going to come over to, to Europe? Um, so I cover EMEA, uh, so we do have an asset in Dubai that I neglected to mention. Uh, we have a site uh, called Hakkasan in Tokyo. Um, within the Tokyo city boundaries, there's a million students and uh, not really a privately built uh, what we would call PBSA sector and provision of quality space. Uh, we have, obviously site values are high in Tokyo, so we have a mock-up uh, to work through you know, micro-living, but with the occupiers being students. Uh, it's very cutting edge, um, and I won't describe it to you because you might fall off your stalls, but from a cultural and country perspective, we feel it can work. We're going through market testing, We've built it literally on a farm, in a warehouse on a, on a, on a farm on the field in, outside of Tokyo. Uh, feedback has been strong uh, so far, and we're looking at the price points and the provision of space. Now, clearly, you know, putting in six people in 14 square meters is, is very micro. Um, has some, some laughs on the stage here. Um, so the provision of, obviously, communal space and that community spirit is, is key. Uh, if we took that concept to London, which I'm not saying we are going to do, we could have rents below £90 pounds per, square, uh, per week. Um, so that technology may or may not apply globally, but obviously as a global platform, we're exploring all opportunities. And that gives you the ability to be able to experiment with different formats, um, different price points potentially then? Yeah, no, no absolutely. Um, you know, I could talk forever about this in Dubai. You know, we have uh, the only asset in the portfolio with a swimming pool. Um, so that's something that, that, that may not work. So, but also something we haven't mentioned is the provision of, um, you know, the sort of mentorship, the community spirit. I was in Dubai last week in the elevator. We had from March 10 
um, social events. You know, cinema evening, we supplied the popcorn. Um, All in the elevator. Well, yes, that's by the, <laughs> in the elevator or the pool, that's, that's up to you. Um, so uh, yoga uh, and other aspects. So that, that's kind of that holistic experience that we can all go to. Just picking up that, that point about pricing, and um, this is for you actually, Philip. Um, in terms of the um, transparency of the market, how easy is it to see yields, rent levels, uh, pricing across Europe? Um, is each country very different? How, how do you see that with your sort of pan-European hat on? Well, we are valuing across Europe. Um, I think it's much easier than it was a year or two ago. Uh, there is still a lack of the level of transactions compared to the UK that makes me always a little nervous. But we spent, every year I say this, I'm sorry, we spent 10 years valuing without any evidence in the UK. So I don't see why you can't do it elsewhere. And there are deals elsewhere. Um, yeah, <laughs> it works sometimes. Um, look, there is, there's a growing body of evidence, but I think one difference is that in some other markets, the markets operate in a different way. There's a, there's a thing in the UK about property people. They tend to think it's okay to talk to each other. You go to Australia, try and get a yield comparable, they'll look at you as though you're asking to, you know, sleep with their sleep with your wife or something. They have a very, very different view on sharing information. And that's true in some European markets. So I think we culturally have the benefit in the UK of probably a bit more discussion between the various agents. And on the whole, we'll sort of boast about our deals and then they'll be used in the next transaction. We've all got to be wary about misquoted net initial yields and so on. We've really got to check what the running costs are. But no, I, you know, to be honest, it's, it could be a lot worse. In, in East Africa, we're, trying, we're, we're valuing right now. We've just valued a portfolio of uh, 6,000 beds in South Africa. Again, there's very little evidence there. So Europe is nascent in some countries in terms of deals and evidence, but at least there are some deals on the whole. Okay, good. Um, and Derek, for you, how, what, are the, what are the kind of criteria key criteria that you're looking at when you're making a judgment? Um, how comparable are the figures that you get? Or are you really kind of building up your own um, information from which you make your investment decisions? I suppose probably the best way to answer that is um, in the case of Dublin. So we entered that market with, with our partner in the front row there. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of price discovery, uh, price discovery and comparables in terms of yields. Um, so we looked at the basis of buying sites, taking it through planning. Um, obviously, total uh, construction cost, t total development cost, and looking at how competitive we could be versus the market. So it's more of an income-focused strategy. Now, did we know the exact pricing in, in that sector? No, because we were making the sector. We were effectively the first mover into the Dublin market. Is, is there now a loss of price discovery? Yes, there's a significant transaction there last year, towards the back end of last year. Um, so that's our approach, you know, to be prudently underwriting each transaction, having that macro perspective and demographics behind you as the following wind, um, and making sure that you can be competitive on the rental side versus the other offerings out there. I just wanted to maybe, uh, maybe pick up um, with you, Keith, just in terms of the the challenges for, for this year, let's think about your business. Um, what are the challenges for that? What are the aspirations? And we'll also then just check to see where everybody else is on that scale at the moment. What, what are your aims? Um, well, the challenges are the same challenge that we face every year, which is occupancy. And in an increasingly competitive marketplace, that becomes more challenging with more product coming in. Um, in the UK, one of our biggest challenges is, to putting it bluntly, late delivery of new build. Um, when people try and build very tightly up to the uh, move-in date and the delivery date, to try and, you know, I can understand the economics of it, but the reality is it causes some big challenges. Um, just to give you a micro example, we have one building in the UK, which we took delivery of mm, just over two weeks ago, 504 beds, and we're nearly 50% led already because you can see it, you can touch it, you can feel it. And 
people forget about the, the sort of the nature of you having to be able to see what you're buying and seeing what you're paying for. Um, that's the fundamental challenge. Um, the other challenge will be continuing to attract international students into our space. But just to give a little bit of context of that as well, we did some numbers recently. We house students from 169 countries on this planet, which I think gives you a sense of actually the movement that we are with young people. And the only other thing I would leave you with is, next time you're in an airport, just sit down for 10 or 15 minutes and look at the age profile of a lot of people walking through it. They are very young, largely, very mobile, and accept the need to move around this planet easily, simply, and increasingly very cheaply, with oil at $50 a barrel. Okay, good. Um, Reiner, quickly with you, uh, challenges, aims for this year? Our um, main challenge in our home market, Germany, is finding the right product. We see a lot of competition, especially with resi developers arising over the last 24 months. Outside of Germany, the main challenge is to find the right balance between gathering intelligence on a potential new market versus the risk of missing opportunities. Okay, good. Paul? <clears throat> I'd say um, the biggest challenge for us in the UK um, is to see how the impact of some of these uncertainties that are in the market are going to play through in this um, leasing cycle. I think uh, there's, there's, you know, there's. I think whilst people believe in the fundamentals, it'll be interesting to see how it does it play out. So. It's always a stressful time anyway, but uh, it'll be more stressful this year than normal. And I think um, across Europe, for us personally, it's, it's really hitting our strategy when there's so much capital looking for a home in student accommodation across Europe. And I think a lot of that capital realizing that all the locations we focus on here, Portugal, Spain, Netherlands, um, France, and Ireland are all attractive now, whereas maybe 18 months ago there was maybe people looking at it with one eye, but now they're firmly um, looking to park capital there. So I think um, it's very different, but I think it'll be an interesting marketplace. Okay, good. Um, Charlie, I'm gonna, this is, there's a terribly self-serving question that I'm going to ask now uh, for the class of 2020, uh, which is, and everybody has to give a suggestion, they can agree should they wish, but uh, what should definitely be on the class of 2020's conference agenda for Lisbon in November. What should definitely be on there? Charlie? Uh, Is it a session one. about the student hotel? That would be nice. <laughs> Pretty boring, I think, for everyone. Uh, I think, for me, I would really like, and I feel that there is value add for everybody to explore more the co-working, co-living. So moving away from the very rigid uh, student room offering and purpose build, I think there is uh, a future in the flexibility of who your customer is and what they do with that room. So indeed, co-working, co-living, that whole environment. Okay, good. Paul, what session? Um, I was actually going to say something similar, but slightly different. Rather than co-working, co-living, I'd really like to explore how the market has evolved into different room concepts and different standards, a bit like what GSA are talking about in Tokyo, because I think you're going to see that as a significant trend as student accommodation starts to emerge into markets um, in Europe where you have that ability to be a bit more flexible and creative. So I think uh, there's some really good things out in the marketplace at the moment. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out over the next couple of years. Okay, good. Rainer. I think it's definitely uh, the borderline between students and young professionals, meaning the co-working, the startup aspect, which we see tripling down into our schemes with an increasing trend. And uh, in addition, um, it's in a way the understanding of the motivations for young people to be that flexible and that mobile as they currently are and uh, I think this trend is increasing strongly over the next years. Um, we all talk a lot about property and actually forget the most important part of this jigsaw which is the customer and I wonder whether we really do understand what our student customer wants from us 
we talk about a thing called the student experience, but nobody really understands what that is and what their expectations are of from the sector. We have a group of people who are very capable of expressing their opinion to the world in a million ways, in places that we don't even know exist, most of us. So I think part of the issue I think we need to is really understand what do they want from us, because otherwise we're maybe not delivering what they really would like. Okay, Derek. Yeah, that ditto from me because the millennial generation of the first generation um, used to, you know, born with the internet and, and apps and, and technology. Um, so really plugging into, there goes my microphone, plugging into uh, their mindset, what they want out of purpose-built student accommodation, the way of living, uh, the flexibility, um, learning programs, uh, and the impact of technology. So that's a bit of a mouthful, but that, that's my answer. Okay, great. Philip? On the agenda, yep. fine wines and canopies. Excellent. <laughs>